The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Before fame or riches, or in this case, great songs can be written, there is family. Tonight, ahead of the world broadcast premiere on TVO of the documentary, Beautiful Scars, musician Tom Wilson is here to reflect on the twists and turns of his remarkable life. Then, given the date, we return to a past conversation on a spooky topic, human curiosity about human remains. It's Monday, October 31st, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Great stories usually have a plot twist that the main character never saw coming. When that's in a memoir, it's all the more compelling. That's certainly the case with Tom Wilson's story. It first came out in his book titled Beautiful Scars, and now it's a captivating documentary by the same name. Tom Wilson is a three-time Juno-winning Canadian musician and artist, and we're delighted to welcome him back to our studio. We're also joined by his daughter, Madeline Wilson, and her Yay! baby, Sam. Hi, Sam. Welcome to you all. Hi, Sam. It's so nice to have ah. you all in the studio. We just all got quiet. <laughs> Sam is not happy about this now at and all. And Sam's giving me that look like, who is this lady and what is she talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but um, before we start our conversation, we wanted to take um, a look at one of your well-known songs, and this is Shine. It's just a matter of time before we get to shine. I should say that I don't know if we've ever had a baby on set, so it's really <laughs> special to have you here with your daughter and your grandchild. My grandson, and you have me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, I because you know uh, I read your book a few years ago and you were in studio and we mm -hmm. spoke about that. Uh, but the, in this documentary, at the end of it, I was in tears. I was bawling. Um, and in the documentary, at the end, you say that everything you create now has a purpose because you know who you are. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel after? Do you feel like after decades of searching and grappling with identity, you are shining now? Well, uh, that's a nice tie-in too. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the idea that. Uh, Without identity, we have nothing to offer the world. And now suddenly I've been working to be an artist for my entire life. And now suddenly with identity, uh, I have a purpose and I have a direction and everything has changed for me. And every day that I wake up to create is that much better. And Madeline, you've been in music industry for a very long time, but you obviously are his daughter and you uh, saw the ups and downs. Um, what was it like to put this documentary together as a family? It's a really interesting, uh, it's been an interesting journey because it's been a long time coming, right? So, I mean, the book and the documentary kind of truncates the whole story mm -hmm. for you, but for us it's been... Um, what do you mean when you say it's been a long time coming? Uh, hills and valleys, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there have been, it's like one step forward, two steps back. We've found little pieces along the way and then pause for a long time. So getting little tidbits of Tom's, of Tom's, you know, the secret as, as we called it in the family, little tidbits, little tidbits, but never really the full, the full piece. So, um, you know, what, by the time we got to the point where Janie eh. came to us and came to my dad and, and shared her truth, we were all, re I, was, I was ready for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the process of putting the documentary together has been a really healing process for, for all of us. Um, we're able to really step back and look at all of the pieces mm -hmm. and analyze them um, from different perspectives, right? So the perspective of the, the person that has experienced it mm -hmm. or the family member that's experienced it, but also someone who is looking at the landscape of this country when we talk about um, what it means to be Indigenous and what indig Indigenous identity is. So mm -hmm. um, being able to look at it through that lens kind of in a more objective way is really interesting as well. You mentioned Janie and Janie grew up as Tom's cousin, but turned 
turned yeah. out to be uh, your mother. And we'll talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about her. But there's something that you said that I thought was so interesting um, because you're a parent, you have mm -hmm. three children. Do you think that you understood your father better after you became a parent? Or did you notice a shift in him when he uh, went on this path to find out who he was? Certainly. I think, uh, you know, I could make a joke about never really understanding <laughs> my dad. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I certainly, uh, there has been a feeling, it's almost like we've all clicked into place. Uh, there's been a, the sense that my dad is really grounded in who he is now. And, I mean, he talks about it. I mean, that piece about identity is so important because it, it gives you, it really does give you purpose and it really it gives you a sense of self. And that has, um, we see that in his art. I mean, my dad has always been a really interesting artist, but there is a depth to his work now that I think comes from where we are. And you called him out about the art, but we'll get into that in a few moments. Um, we can clarify. Uh, yeah, that we, we can yeah. get into that in a second. Uh, but your son Thompson is also in the documentary. Uh, do you feel like your children understand you better now that you have the backstory to who you are? Well, I've been really, uh, really close with my kids and now my grandkids. Um, that bond um, has taken different shapes. Madeline and I work together promoting concerts uh, in Hamilton. She managed Blackie and the Rodeo Kings with Alan Moy. My son came on the road with me when he was 16 and was on the road with me through high school. And uh, I mean, the first I went up to his bedroom, my bass player quit and I had a show in Philadelphia. And I said, hey, uh, listen, what are you doing? Do you know these songs well enough to come in and do a show? He goes, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. So, I mean, he, he, he worked with me and wrote with me and recorded with me, uh, created with me for, for many, many years. So we have an understanding on that level. Uh, Madeline and I have an understanding in that I was uh, uh, out of, completely out of my mind uh, in my 20s when Madeline was born. And uh, Madeline, I continued to be out of my mind, but I, I definitely had a sense that I had somebody on the planet that I knew I belonged with. Mm -hmm. And before that, the, without having that, that, that sense of identity, I, I was kind of like a kite without a string mm -hmm. for, for my entire life. And then Madeline came along and I felt like I had finally had somebody that I, I could, was blood on blood, that blood on blood feeling that I'd been looking for. I think Sam is saying, don't forget about me. Yeah, oh yeah, Sam. It must Sam, be. You know what, Sam's <laughs> gonna end up, he's gonna get thrown off the show like Rich, <laughs> like Richard Pryor got shown, uh, thrown off the Mike Douglas show back in the 70s. <laughs> you can stay as long as you want, Sam. When you're ready, just let us know. Um, but it must be such a, a trip to have grandchildren. Well, yeah, um, uh, surprise, surprise, you know, all my grandsons were surprises and uh, they're welcome surprises. I mean, uh, it's been a family that has been uh, uh, welcoming surprises our entire lives. Okay, yeah. I want to share a clip of the documentary with the audience because we haven't seen anything yet. Lorraine, please roll. When you start digging into the truths of your life that you actually weren't aware of, it jars your memories. Someone decided that it needed to be a secret. His world was unraveling. There's nothing you can do. This whole world's starting to crumble on him because of it. He didn't know what his history was. My dad didn't know that he was missed. Meanwhile, back home, there were people that knew of him, who thought of him, who, who missed him, who wondered about him. We always knew that Grandma Bunny was not Tom's mother. And she said, uh, there's secrets about you that I'll take to my grave. In the clip, uh, Madeline, you were pregnant with Sam. Um, yeah. And the secrets being taken to the grave, that didn't happen. Tom, what did you learn late in your life? <clears throat> well, um, nine years ago, uh, I found out from a stranger that uh, uh, that Bunny and George Wilson were not my mother and father. Now, Bunny and George, uh, the math, it didn't add up. Bunny and George were too old, really, to be having kids, especially in that era, you know. People are now having careers and lives and uh, then having children. That, that wasn't the case back in the 50s. So uh, George Wilson was a, uh, 
was blinded in the Second World War. He was a tail gunner and a Lancaster bomber. And for those listeners that viewers that don't know, um, tail gunner position in Lancaster and Halifax bombers in the Second World War were known as the suicide seat. Most of the young men, boys that uh, sat in that seat didn't make it home. George Wilson did make it home with massive head injury, uh, totally blind, and uh, and his his own loss of who he was and no chance to reinvent himself. Um, so th there was George and then there was Bunny Wilson who was also older. She was probably 47 when I came into their home and she was a French Canadian gal. She had the temperament of a scalded cat and uh, <laughs> uh, you know. That's very descriptive. <laughs> I, I, I happen to be a writer so. <laughs> um, uh, yeah so she uh, 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 that household uh, really, w a, w a child really didn't belong in that household, but somehow I grew up there. I was kind of like Marilyn from the Munsters, you know what I mean? I was, I was uh, this uh, flower growing up in, in the middle of, uh, you know, stone and, and gravel. Um, they were the most loving people that I could ever imagine. Bunny Wilson is still, still the greatest person I'll ever know. Mm -hmm. But... Um, uh, finding out about this uh, at the age of uh, 53, um, uh, this journey has just begun for me. Uh, I found out that uh, not only am I not the puffy, sweaty Irish guy that I thought I was, I'm actually Mohawk. And while driving my cousin Janie home from uh, one of my grandson's birthday parties, uh, I was driving her home a couple weeks after I'd found this out. And um, I said, Janie, I found out that mom and dad weren't really my mom and dad. And if you ever remember anything, I know you were close with them. And she turned to me and said, Tom, I don't know how to tell you this. And I'm sorry. And I hope you forgive me, but I'm your mother. Janie is Mohawk from Ganawage. My father was Mohawk from Ganawage. I am now accepted and the paperwork is there to prove that I am now a Mohawk of Mo, uh, Mohawk territory in Ganawage. Um, I want to follow up quickly, but Madeleine, if you, um, if Sam needs to take a, a little break, uh, I can ask you the question sure. if you want to. Uh, sure, you want to go see Sam? Yeah, um, because when your dad is talking about um, finding out his identity, but I just want to go back a little bit to talk uh, a little bit about a bunny, uh, yeah. because Bunny was your grandmother, mm -hmm. and there must be some complicated feelings uh, about the, that relationship because she held the secret and essentially kept his mom away from him, your grandmother away from you for so long. Um, how would you describe how, I guess, have you reconciled those feelings about her? I think that, uh, it's real, honestly, I don't know. How's that? I think that I have moments where, like, my love for Bunny is <laughs> is so big and it's so powerful, and that's all that I see. But as a mother, hearing how Janie was kept from her baby, mm. it, it really challenges um, not my love for Bunny, but my understanding for Bunny. Mm and for my under, what I knew Bunny to be, because for me growing up, she was really the champion of the underdog, um, had, has the, had the biggest heart I've ever known, has taught me so much I know about my own empathy. And so the kind, the coldness that came with keeping Janie away is, wanna come see me? Speaking of which, <laughs> is, is, uh, is challenging. Yeah, um, it must be, because I think a lot of people who have been adopted don't get the opportunity to be reunited with their parents, their mm -hmm. birth parents. What's it been like to have that gift given to you as a grandchild and to you as a son? Well, um, we were always together, Janie and I. She was my first cousin. She was always on the 
on the fringe of, of whatever was happening. Even in, in the video, the very few video clips we have of her and Bunny together, you know, the party's going on, the kids are opening presents, there's songs going on, Bunny's helping with the food, and Janie is kind of on, on the border, you know, standing back, not to make too much of herself in the situation. She lived her entire life like that, oppressed like that. She was a woman that was allowed to be in the same household as her baby, but wasn't allowed to bathe me or uh, pick me up when I was crying or feed me or, or anything like she that. She wasn't even allowed to hold you when she gave birth to you? No, okay. uh, she was t I was taken right from her. She knew that I was born at about 8, 10 in the morning because uh, before they put her out, uh, after I, she gave birth to me, she looked at the clock and saw that time. She, uh, uh, I was taken right from her and given over to the, I get the Catholic Children's Aid and put into a nursery. And she wandered the halls of St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton, looking in at the nursery, wondering which baby was hers, not knowing if I was a boy or if I was a girl. So this is, this is a woman who, by the way, I took to her foot doctor, several foot doctor appointments yesterday, um, who is, uh, in case you don't know, women should be ruling the world, but Mohawk women actually do rule the world. So um, she was a woman that uh, deserves to be loved and uh, understood, and uh, she deserves all the patience and understanding that I can possibly give her. And we still aren't reunited completely as mother and child, but we are working really hard at it. We sat... Uh, in, in, in one of her podiatrist's appointments a couple years ago, uh, she leaned over to me and she had a nylon jacket on, it was winter time. And we'd never been to this doctor and she leaned over and the sound of the nylon jacket coming in. Mm. And she leaned over like this and it was almost like she was going to do one, a silent dog vomit into my lap. And she said, today, Tom, I'm gonna to introduce you to the doctor as my son Aww. and that was the first time in like 60 years that she was able to acknowledge to somebody a stranger that she my was son. my son and we went into the podiatrist's office and she said to the doctor she says hello doctor i'd like to see you i'd like to you to meet my son who i brought to the appointment today so these are these steps you know Janie's 83 i'm 63 We've lived a lifetime together, but we've lived completely apart. Madeline, in the documentary, you, you make a comment about how Janie would take the bus to come to, like, birthday parties, and it was kind yeah. of like, that's not something that a cousin does. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, Janie was, she took the bus when my brother was born, from Toronto. You know, my brother was born in Hamilton, and she came from Toronto to be there. She was, she came around, I think, when at some point when I was born, you know, with gifts and... She was always present. She was present in a way, like I said in the documentary, that a, you know, a, a cousin or a second cousin just isn't. You know, we have family, and we have our, you know, our aunties, but it was different. It was always different. It was always, um, and I think my dad describes it really well. Like she was just kind of floating on the peripheral um, of the scene, but she was there, and she wanted to be there. And there was a, you know, she carried herself with sort of a pride in those moments. Like she, like they, these were her. These were her descendants, and these are her children, and her grand. This is her son and her grandchildren, and you know she's quietly proud. I, I can't imagine like the <laughs> anguish she had to not even interject herself in your lives as I am this person. Um, but we want to show another um, clip of the documentary. Madeline, you say in the doc, my dad didn't know that he was missed at home, mm. like when he would go on the road. Um, so we're gonna take a look at another clip. One time, I flew to Costa Rica, disappeared down there. Cocaine was like uh, 25 bucks US a gram. Took LSD, almost died in the Pacific Ocean. I went out there into the water, and the LSD had already kicked in. Got turned upside down and started swimming as hard as I could, thinking that I was going to the surface, but I was swimming to the bottom. That's exactly how my life was at that time. You could have died. Yeah. Madeline, as a daughter watching that, what goes through your head? Well, I think there were a few times you could have died when you were away. Yeah, I... So. I... 
I, uh, I was a bit of a, you know, gymnast out there, I guess. I was a bit of a trickster. It's, it's shocking. You know, I'm at home playing with my Barbie dolls or, you know, in the backyard and someone you love so dearly is out there. It's, it's hard to hear now, but I'm grateful he's around. You've talked about being Mohawk, um, and in the documentary, you talk about being living proof of colonialism, mm -hmm. how it erases the person. We also now know uh, more about intergenerational trauma. Uh, to what extent has this intergenerational trauma touched your family? Well, I think, I think it goes on. I don't like to dwell on that too much because I don't want uh, the power of what I have to offer and what the story is to be a sob story. I want it to be something that is enriching and inspiring. And uh, you kind of have to straighten up your back a little bit and you have to flex yourself a little bit in order to be those things. That doesn't mean that uh, my vulnerability isn't revealed. And that doesn't mean that I didn't put all the truth down. And putting the truth down is is so empowering. Mm -hmm. You have to remember, uh, when I wrote that book, the first book, I'm writing the second book, which is in fact called Blood Memory, which has to do with the things that live inside us, our, our generational trauma, our generational talents, the things that are passed on to us by our ancestors that live inside us and that are here for a reason, and that it takes time for us to recognize those things. but. Um, I, I don't, uh, I don't intend in, in stopping telling my story and I hope that I can at least open the door of possibilities to somebody else to feel the strength to be able to, uh, to keep going. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you the same uh, question, Madeline. We should just say that uh, Sam is decided to leave the set. Yeah. He, <laughs> he, he is like Richard Pryor on the Mike Douglas show. He is, he's actually left the set. He, is, he loves his left the set. But, you know, as a daughter and as a mother, um, I wanted to ask you that same question. Is this something that you think about or mindful of? The intergenerational yeah. trauma? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that um, it's really important to hear stories like my dad's or, or you know, uh, people in our lives. Because uh, intergenerational trauma is not an abstract concept. Mm -hmm. It exists in our lives day to day uh, in various ways, whether it's through my dad's story, whether it's um, residential school survivor stories. But, it's, but it exists, it lives and breathes in our lives um, in ways that, in ways that you touch and you feel and 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 can impact you and can shake up your <laughs> shake up everything you know and it can also just be this insidious being that exists in your home mm -hmm. and we need to acknowledge those and we need to see what that we need to see that mm -hmm. uh, i think you know you ta asked about being a, a daughter and a mother mm -hmm. and it's a really interesting place for me when it comes to my identity because I am on this path where I am teaching my children what it means to be Mohawk while I learn, but I'm also teaching my dad. A hundred percent. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. A hundred percent. Also, what we do with, with, our, with, these knowledge, with this knowledge that we have, what we do with this blood memory is important. So. I work not only through my writing and through my music and through my visual art, but uh, we're also getting trees planted back home in Ganawage. We, uh, Madeline, with her, in, with, with her drive, actually, we've started uh, the first uh, Indigenous uh, bursary scholarship for Indigenous students at McMaster University. Um, and and uh, and then of course, uh, believe it or not, I got arrested for the first time out at uh, fourteen ninety. Only the first time. For, uh, it, <laughs> truly, oh, yeah, it? yeah, I know. I, I just could run faster than the other guys, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Uh, I got arrested out at 1492 Land Back Lane uh, for feeding land defenders uh, in Caledonia, Ontario, uh, the land track of the Grand River, which is five miles each side of the Grand River that was given to them after the War of 1812 by uh, the British government, which, of course, has been uh, uh, just shredded and turned into uh, Brantford, Ontario, Caledonia, Ontario, all along the Grand River. So I had heard that this was going on. I heard that there was terrorists on the Grand River. So I went out to see these terrorists. I brought food to them. And uh, I went Skylar Williams, uh, you know, and uh, Layla Stats. And there was people cooking pots of stew. And, uh, and there was people doing ceremonies. There was kids playing lacrosse. So those are the terrorists that I went to have a look at. And I brought them food, and I went out and played a couple songs for them and stuff like that, and then the OPP arrested me. That's, to me, the hard work, right? The, the work that comes to me naturally is creating art. The hard work is finding a, where to dig in and be active and make a difference so that you're doing positive work for the people who are out there throwing themselves on the line and you do the hard work for people who want to achieve something that might not be attainable to them without a bursary at McMaster University to help them out. You mentioned art, and uh, we have some of your pieces to show. But in the documentary, there's a moment where uh, you called out your dad for cultural <laughs> appropriation. Um, Madeline, you want to talk about that? Yes. Well, on the journey of finding identity, yeah. one of uh, the pieces, you know, I started long, long before my dad was There's some was art there. there. There's your art there. Yeah. Long before my dad was there, long before Janie came forward, I started doing my own digging. And so it was digging into what it, Mo our Mohawk identity could look like. And one of the ways I thought I could convince my dad to <laughs> do, dig a bit harder himself was to threaten him. <laughs> so I said, you know, dad, because his art is incredible. Mm. And he was, he was, it was very popular. He was selling all this art. And I said, you know, if you're just out there as, as a white guy selling this art, you're going to be accused of cultural appropriation. I and, didn't know what that meant. No, I think we still are working on, <laughs> working on that. <laughs> but now when you look at it, uh, do you think, uh, you talked about uh, blood memory, but it was there all along. It was yeah. there all along. I've been yeah. painting like this since 1997. I started painting because I was trying to stop drinking in 1997. I've been successfully clean and sober for 23 years, but this is what I was painting because this is what came naturally to me were simple shapes and, and detail. And now I, my work has evolved and we've evolved it even into um, uh, exhibits, uh, exhibitions, uh, installations. Uh, one installation is at the Stratford Festival and it is uh, dealing with identity in residential schools. We, we built nine school desks and we burned the uh, images of families, including my great grandfather, Peter Lazar, into the tops of the desks. And as you move forward, the images start to disappear, representing the loss of identity and language and culture. And uh, I also, uh, a film component goes with that. And then I built two eight foot nuns and uh, building the nuns wasn't enough. So I splattered blood on their faces and put them in the schoolroom so that we have to face this as a country and we have to look at something that uh, we might wander into as a little art exhibit, but we have to see uh, what this country has done has been responsible for one of the grossest and most inhumane acts against other human beings in the history of the world, Canada. So let's start talking about that freely mm -hmm. and let's start really seeing what it is that has happened here so we can start doing the work to try and make it better. I should mention that this is one of your pieces. Mm -hmm. and, and when we talk about truth of how um, Canadians, how we start to look at ourselves and the, uh, the history this country has, uh, the atrocities that it has committed. Um, at the beginning of the documentary, you say truth is a uh, blank. Yeah. <laughs> I won't use the word. Um, but in this journey to find out who you are, to uh, find this truth, what has this given to you both individually? Uh, Madeline, I'll start with you and end with Tom. I think it's, I feel empowered. I feel really empowered. I think uh, for me, the struggles of uh, my own identity 
have been um, up and have been have been up and down, because he was adopted. I don't have a status card. What does it mean to be Mohawk? You know, it's the, it's been it's been challenging to try and find my place in this, as well because I'm you know Tom is my guide, Dad's my guide. So it's like a little bit of pushing that's been going. Like I need you just to just move a little forward because I I'm curious up here too. So. Um, there's been that, but one of the things, one of the most powerful things that's been said to me that really uh, made me feel confident in what I was doing is my partners, you know, I was going, we were having this conversation. I was talking about how I don't know, can I own my identity? Can I say I'm Mohawk? And feeling in, you know, you have these moments of insecurity. And he said, your DNA is in the ground in Ganawake. That's who you are. And it was, it really is something I think about a lot. I think about it I, probably daily. And, um, and that's, that is the truth, right? For, for, for our family, that's, where we, that's our community. And, and with that, you really think about what does it mean to be Mohawk? How do you carry yourself? What does it mean to be in this family? And how do you carry yourself with respect to those two things? It's really important. And Tom? Wow, that's, you know, Madeline and my mother kicked some serious ass in that movie, man. I actually didn't really need to show up because they're so <laughs> honest and well-spoken. Um, to continue to tell my own truth is important because I was lied to my entire life by all the people that I relied on to guide me through this world, to introduce me to this world. I was introduced to this world. I was a lie. So it's my job as the last man standing to continue to tell the truth, to tell what I believe is the truth. And in doing that, you know, uh, I guess I've broken a few eggs, but let it be known that my love for my mother my daughter, my son, my family, my grandsons, uh, and Bunny and George are, are paramount to to who I am today. And uh, you know, uh, I guess you know the you got to sin to get saved, I guess. And uh, let's just say that I'm I'm working on the saved part now. Tom, I also just want to say that my mother didn't want to be in this film. Mm. And it was because of not only the uh, artistic vision, but uh, the truth that Shane Belcourt, the director, brought to this film. He tied everything together. And uh, he brought over a dozen donuts <laughs> and some coffee to my mother and sat with her. And she decided she was going to be in the film because uh, he brought his heart to the table. So Shane Belcourt, we owe a great debt to Shane Belcourt on this. It is a beautiful documentary, and it's. I'm so glad that she was in it because I think it's also a legacy for the grandchildren and your family moving forward. Yeah. Uh, Tom and Madeline, thank you so much for spending so much time with us, and also for being so generous uh, with this conversation, and also Sam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hopefully I can pull on his toes afterwards. Um, <laughs> and for everybody at home, can tune in after this program is ended for the world premiere of Beautiful Scars coming up next on TVO at 9 p.m. Miriam Nafti sees dead people, studies them and the people enthralled by them to be more precise. She is a forensic anthropologist at McMaster University and she joins us now to explain the historical and contemporary curiosity of human beings for human remains. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you. I read some of your thesis and I'm actually really surprised by how creeped out I, oh. I was by some of it. <laughs> it's really fascinating, but why study human remains? Well, my training is as a forensic anthropologist, so I've always been around human remains. And my, uh, the, the point of studying human remains in a forensic context is to assert identity, to ascertain identity uh, for a legal investigation. But my research went beyond that because I looked at the collection of human remains, um, you know, amongst private collectors, uh, anatomical specimens for museums, and also for buying and selling really that human remains are everywhere outside of institutional collecting. 
which is really surprising. Um, why, like I said, that I got creeped out by reading. Why do you think that we're so, um, I guess, cautious about talking about death and dead, like human remains being around that? Well, curiously enough, the use of human remains is really not to remind us of death or to scare us or to create taboos around death. Mm -hmm. it's, mo it's the opposite, rather. So for the case of institutional collecting with uh, medical specimens, uh, museums that, you know, mummies and bog people, um, other archaeological collections and specimens, and um, also for the church, the Catholic Church, they have their own traditions of displaying uh, human remains in the form of relics. These are not for death purposes, but really to remind us of a variety of things. So for institutional collecting, you have uh, issues of identity and membership. If you belong to a certain museum, you, your uh, remains represent the institution. So the more prestigious your collection, the more prestigious your institution. These aren't houses of death. Um, likewise with private collectors, uh, collecting tribal art, shrunken heads, um, various carved skulls. These are about personal uh, narratives, personal identity. Likewise with artists that have collected and used human remains. They're discussing their own life experiences. They're not warning us about death. They're not scaring us. And again, these are not about um, uh, creating issues around death. But again, right, the opposite, it's, it's celebrating life. And it's really a, a, an embedded tradition in Western society. It's not really anything new or recent. I want to talk about the Catholic Church in a, a minute, but I yes. wanted to make the distinction between something that you say in your thesis, between uh, disposed and undisposed dead. What's yes. the difference? Well, with the circulation of human remains in our society, mm -hmm. these are remains that have been either exhumed for a variety of reasons, uh, and they, or they have never been disposed of. So they, they haven't been contained. The disposed dead really represent the issues of death and grief and mourning and memorialization. Largely the disposed dead are the dead that we know. They've been identified, uh, their loved ones, um, or their family uh, they're members, marked, right? yeah, mm -hmm. family members, et cetera. They're not anonymous. Mm -hmm. The undisposed dead are for the most part anonymous dead. We don't really know who they are and how they've arrived where they are. Mm -hmm. For example, mummies and bog people and archeological specimens and medical specimens and so on. There's very rarely a name attached to these individuals. So that was the focus of my research, or largely those remains that are circulating throughout society. And I wanted to talk about the Catholic Church. Yes. Let's go back a bit in time. And uh, the Catholic Church has, pl has played an important role in our interest in human remains. How? Funny enough, um, when you read the academic literature uh, in a lot of my research, the issue was that the Catholic Church, or the assertion was that the Catholic Church was against anatomical research and against um, anatomical dissection. But I argued the opposite, is that as a result of the Catholic Church's traditions of making and displaying relics, that's why we have a tradition of dissection medicine. So really, modern medicine, dissection anatomy specifically, is an upshot of the Catholic Church. So when did the Catholic Church get this reputation of being anti-science? I think throughout there was this sense, it, it was a, actually a mistaken, um, mistaken interpretation of a papal decree in the, in the late 1200s, in the 13th century, where the Pope was thought to have prevented, or at least uh, made it illegal for Catholics to open up and divide the body, or to dismember, burn, or uh, boil remains. But actually it was a, a funerary requirement uh, to not bring back these remains. Of course, the Crusades were quite popular at the time, and uh, there was a lot of that going on. There were a lot of dead bodies coming back across Europe. They wanted to prevent another plague, and they wanted to prevent bodies from arriving with you know, festering maggots and highly decomposed. So he was essentially asking them to bury them where they were, rather than trying to bring them across and you know, dism dismember them and carry them back to their place of origin. And in that I, sense, bringing the disease back or? Bringing the diseases back, right. Yeah. Really, it, there was no taboo with the dead body because most of the Catholic churches at the time, as they still are, mm -hmm. house human remains. So what would the spiritual um, reason be for opening up a corpse? 
Well, there are a variety of reasons. We really have the first, the foundation of the first autopsies happening in churches, to opening up bodies, to look at organs, to understand, you know, if this was a pure heart, if this was a criminal heart, mm -hmm. the cause of death, uh, and uh, I think there was also the the element of uh, preserving a lot of these pieces, especially if they were nobility, mm -hmm. they were clergy, uh, martyrs, uh, holy people. Uh, future future saints, mm -hmm. uh, etc., and they would have uh, provided for those uh, mum uh, not mummification per se, but preservation, a variety of, of methods of preserving them, mm -hmm. and then housing them as, in in reliquaries for veneration. I thought it was really interesting um, reading your, some of your part of your thesis, where churches were built on relics, and uh, then then people became more powerful because they actually owned these human bodies. Right, yeah, oh, there's a proliferation remains. of them throughout the early Middle Ages mm -hmm. and uh, early medieval times of uh, building these, ma what became massive cathedrals, mm -hmm. but they were originally shrines. So there are, they are burial grounds, and they also house a lot of remains embedded in altars and walls mm -hmm. and underground. Um, and that was really the difference too with the Reformation, with the Protestant Reformation, is that they removed all of that. They removed the, the dead body from the church. Mm. And uh, again, those are the, the major split. That's the major split in terms of distinguishing between the two. So with the Catholic Church, you still have this veneration of the remains mm -hmm. of the dead being very important and vital to the continuity of the church. That's something I think a lot of people have dismissed as being this outdated tradition, but it's, it's not. It's very current and it's still very powerful. And when did Western medicine become interested in human remains? Well, as a result of the traditions of the church. So you see the early anatomy schools were really uh, located in the sources of papal power mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, they're, they're paying for it, essentially. They had supported it very much, so the flowering of, of anatomy, uh, anatomical research came about in the early Renaissance. Mm -hmm. uh, it was being done already within the Catholic Church, but then you have uh, papal centers paying for uh, these, these, the, the growth of anatomy schools. So the interest really flowers then in, the, in, in anatomical research and, then, and also preserving remains. What did the general public at the time think of using dead bodies in this way? I think it was very common and those who were going to anatomy schools were used to seeing these public dissections. Mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were also events that you could pay to attend. If you were of the uh, noble class or aristocratic, you could pay and observe uh, a dissection, and it was this also a, a sense of a, <clears throat> it was a festive time as well. It was very celebratory. Mm -hmm. It was very fascinating for the people because it was unusual as well if there was an infamous criminal um, that was also part of the continuity of their punishment. Mm -hmm. If they had been hung at the gallows, then the body would be taken for dissection, and, and that was considered possibly redeeming for that individual religiously. I just find it interesting <laughs> that um, these unknown, because these were unknown people, or they had committed a crime, um, how these mm -hmm. unknown bodies were being watched in, I guess, entertainment, education, <clears throat> by people with money. It's like the, it's creating a hierarchy. And you also say that the living usurp the dead. Yes. What do you mean by that? In terms of imposing their own narratives mm -hmm. and their own identity, <clears throat> And it comes through institutional collecting. Mm -hmm. So once again, if you have a very prestigious collection, mm -hmm. it's not about the individuals in that collection. It's about the institution that houses that collection. So you have very famous uh, medical museums around the world now, m getting more and more popular through social media. And uh, it's really about uh, their authority and their institution and knowledge. Uh, because the idea is that you are gauging, you are, you are creating an opportunity for uh, knowledge and information and education, and also you're uh, creating avenues for learning about these individuals, but uh, providing access to the dead in sanctioned ways. Um, and likewise, with the church, uh, it's not about um, you as an individual coming to see this, relic or venerating this relic, mm -hmm. but about celebrating the power of the Catholic Church at the same time uh, celebrating that individual's uh, martyrdom and their holiness and their ability to intervene on your behalf. 
uh, so you would you would pray to these saints mm -hmm. to ask for help, uh, to ask for guidance, um, wisdom, mm -hmm. healing, and these saints would intervene on your behalf. So it's their inherent power. And nowadays, you can buy human remains on Craigslist everywhere. That's astonishing. Everywhere. It's How big unusual. is this market? Like it's massive because yeah. it's worldwide and it's largely uncontrolled. Mm -hmm. And this is also with my research uh, looked at. Uh, the loopholes uh, that provide opportunities to buy and sell human remains. It's very easy mm -hmm. to do that. A lot of graves have been plundered. A lot of human remains make their way onto social media and into auctions, private collections. And it's, it's, it's easy to do. And are there any rules or laws governing? There are a lot of rules <laughs> and regulations and laws, but people get in and through them. If you can purchase your remains as medical specimens, then mm -hmm. somehow that passes. <clears throat> but it's very difficult, especially to the untrained eye, to distinguish between forensic remains and an, an anatomical specimens. It's mm -hmm. easy to take remains and create the idea that these are medical, old medical pieces. Uh, and, and oftentimes that's what's done. Um, so they're easy. And then a lot of people coming from Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, renovations and, and excavations that, that interfere with burial remains, <clears throat> excuse me, burial grounds. And um, it's easy to throw in skulls in your knapsack as a trekker through Europe and then bring them home and sell them or put them into your collection. Now, how would you characterize? characterize somebody who wants to own human remains? Well, you find that it's very popular amongst young people. It's a, a goth tradition. That's something that's very celebrated. And it's also considered quite, <clears throat> I think, status making if you've got a good personal collection. You often see that on social media. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get, uh, they, they acquire notoriety or fame uh, if they've got this massive collection of human remains and somehow they're cool and uh, they they are knowledgeable or they have membership to some cool club you know it's 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 along those lines the remains that have pedigree that have been acquired through a variety of dealers and they were bought for a high price at auction they're going to have the biggest price they're going to have the you know that you're going to acquire that status through mm -hmm. the pedigree of those remains if they are prized relics um, those also fetch a high price at market then there's the black market um, where it's you know the the dealers and the private collectors know um, what's really uh, popular and and what is desirable Bill Jameson was one of the largest collectors in in Ontario, in mm -hmm. Canada, really. And he housed a lot of uh, these. Um, Who was Bill Jameson? Bill Jameson was a private collector here in, in Toronto. He mm -hmm. passed away a couple of years ago. But he had a very prestigious collection because it was mixed in with high end art mm -hmm. and historical artifacts. So once his remains, once his uh, collection broke up uh, through various auctions, um, it's acquired a pedigree. So if, you've, if you're able to acquire a Jameson's piece, mm -hmm it's already worth a lot on the market. That's, so maybe example, one day we would be mo worth more? <laughs> it depends. And it depends on who you were yeah. and, and how you arrived on, on, in someone's collection. Tribal art is also very, uh, very expensive because it's rare and uh, it's old. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is quite beautiful. And they, they come from different parts of the world. And in, in your thesis, you talk to several artists who incorporate human remains into their art. Yes. Um, how do they do this? Well, um, I looked at five artists that were essentially well established. So they are, they are not young. They've been at this for, for several decades. Mm -hmm. And they did so in a variety of ways. One is Joel Peter Witkin. He's got a cult following. He's three feature documentary films about his life. Mm -hmm. And he w basically walked into morgues and assembled these tableaus with flowers and fruits and props and human remains and photograph them. And his photographs are very, very expensive um, art pieces. Um, and he has prestigious shows in museums and galleries around the world. So I looked at his work, and I looked at others that integrate human skin or bones or fetal hearts. In the case of Wayne Martin Belger, who makes cameras, mm -hmm. photographs um, individuals with these human remains integrated as part of his camera. 
And he was taking example. pictures of pregnant women. That was um, with the fetal heart the fetal camera. Heart. Yes. Yeah. But he also has a camera where he has the uh, HIV positive blood acting as a filter. And he does portraits of HIV positive individuals as, again, a part of a uh, gallery installation. We have a, an image of a human skull taken by Ryan Matthew Cohn, a bone collector and artist who sells antiques like this on his website. Um, now, people might look at this and say it's just an old human skull from another time. What are some ethical considerations one should have before buying something like this? Well, in that situation, this is a Kapala skull. This is from a, a, an old Buddhist Mm -hmm. tradition. So these are not unusual in, in Nepal and Tibet, for example. Um, they have a rich tradition, Buddhist tradition, of using human remains for a variety of reasons, for ritual reasons, mm -hmm. and in that case, um, for drinking and celebrating and uh, calling on the dead uh, as part of a prayer tradition. So these remains are not unusual and they're not difficult to get. In terms of ethical considerations, well, if you're a Buddhist, there aren't, there aren't any ethical conditions or, or preconditions. These are um, required for, for a variety of, of prayers and rituals. Uh, for individuals like Ryan, he's got an extensive private collection of his own and he buys and sells all the time. Um, ethical considerations, it's, it's a tricky question because these are part of our material culture. They've, they're, all, again, worldwide, and they arrive at us through a variety of means. Uh, but I would say to keep an eye out on where these remains are from uh, to, to, to determine whether these are forensic or not. But again, if in an un, with an untrained eye, it's difficult to ascertain this, next to impossible. Do you have any human remains? I don't. I have a, um, pieces that are f an anatomical collection that I use for teaching, mm -hmm. but I don't have a private collection myself, no. And um, you also write about dark tourism. Yes. What is that? Dark tourism refers to the practice of visiting places of disaster uh, where death has occurred, public executions, torture, uh, these sorts of places that tend to fascinate people. Mm -hmm. um, so you usually have these, they, they are tourist sites and people arrive because they know of what's happened at this particular site. And these again, these are all over the world and they attract people for, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the thrill that knowing something has happened, something bad has happened here. And oftentimes they house remains um, or uh, pictures uh, or uh, at least a graphic description of what went on and then you have tour guides explaining the graphic details. They may house um, artifacts from that time. The more authentic these places are, the more popular they are. Um, it sounds like we have an obsession with how people die or with death. Is it because we all know it's just around the corner? I oh, think and we don't want to think about it or? I think there's a, a there's both that. There's a paradox. We're fascinated by it. We're afraid of it, mm -hmm. but we know it's inevitable, and yet we try and prevent it. Largely, I, I find that the people that are the most fascinated with death and wanting these death experiences are people that are young and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, you're not really faced with your own mortality. It's, it's an exciting time. Uh, these are people that often enjoy horror movies. Um, or being afraid, you know, through haunted castle walks and death walks, and and uh, they like hearing the stories, the grisly details in the stories. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of us who have been at crime scenes that are quite graphic and uh, very uh, very disturbing, I tend to avoid them mm -hmm. simply because I have a very different reality associated with them, with experiencing that. Mm -hmm. Likewise, you find with people who are terminally ill or um, they're elderly and fragile, I don't think they're going to enjoy that, that, that experience as, as much. Do you think it's just um, youth or do you think we're just too blasé about death now? I think for the most part there is, it is a youth issue uh, where it's fun and games and it really isn't about death. Mm -hmm. This is about popularity in social media in the case of the selfies. Mm -hmm. In other situations where you know you have public execution still around the world, 
Um, we don't have that tradition here anymore in North America, in the Western society, mm -hmm. but you still have that in other non-Western societies, and you have images proliferating, social media, of live executions. Uh, these are not unusual. These are becoming more and more popular, but it was also much of our own tradition. So at the turn of the last century, there, was, there were photographs of public executions. When photography was, was first coming out, mm -hmm. there was a lot of memento mori photography as well, mm -hmm. where people, you know, it was expensive to take photographs for family members. If you could afford that one photograph, it was oftentimes the last photograph of that individual. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of individuals photographed in their coffins, or at their funeral, or laid out in their bed. Uh, there's that element of photography. That hasn't gone away either because that's, that's also still with us. Mm -hmm. And then you have the public execution photographs. And then the whole genre of lynching photography that was also very popular. And these were created as postcards that were sent out to you know, relatives across borders that couldn't attend. Mm -hmm. And it was to catch everybody up on what the news was. Even on the news, you mm -hmm. see images of car crashes and of, you know, you see a body, even though it's covered, it's obviously, you know, yeah. if, it's a, if that's your family member, you know, yes. it probably impacts you differently. It's fairly tame here in North America mm -hmm. uh, compared to, let's say, South America, where the front pages are very grisly and very graphic. and you know, people find that quite normal. It's, it's been fairly normalized because death is so uh, common mm -hmm. and, and a very, um, very visualized in, in these cultures. It's, not, it's considered poor taste for our front page newspapers covering crime scenes and accidents for them to be as graphic. And newspapers oftentimes reject those photographs. These photographs exist, mm -hmm. and sometimes they find their way into social media or private collections of, of such crime scene photographs. But for the most part, newspapers would reject putting that on the front page. They try, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit of titillation in trying to cross that boundary to mm -hmm. see how far they can get. It used to be the case in the 1950s, 1960s. If you compare early newspaper photographs of crime scenes, we've toned it down. Um, considerably. Thank you so much for being here. It's Thank been you. a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for being on the agenda. That is the agenda for Monday, October 31st, 2022. Does your personality change over your lifetime? Tomorrow, Steve explores that and some of the latest thinking on how we became who we are. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TBO and for joining us online at TBO.org. And Steve, we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TBO's journalism.